When I was 22 years old, I started working at a large residential center for kids who suffered terrible abuse and neglect. These kids had all suffered horrific trauma in their lives. They were all very angry. They didn't trust anybody. They were hypersensitive to power being misused against them. But they all ached for someone to love them and believe in them. So we loved those kids. So we learned early on that we had to develop strategies and techniques that would bring out the best in every one of those kids, that would uncover the treasure that existed within. Techniques like saying please and thank you to the kids every single time we make a request of them. Believe it or not, that's my number one feedback in 40 years in the business. I can bump into a social worker, a foster parent, juvenile justice worker. Number one thing I hear is, Charlie, you're right. Ever since we started saying please and thank you to the kids, every time we make a simple request to them, the whole mood of my group has changed. Why is please and thank you my number one feedback? It's not the social etiquette. Sure, we should model that. It's because everything we say in the world has two components, a content and a message. You know? And kids, particularly kids who have suffered trauma, kids who don't trust, they're hypersensitive to the message you're sending. The words you use, the look on your face, how fast you approach a kid, all of that is sending a message. And you can make or break an interaction just with the message you're sending. I can say, hey, Sean, you look great today. Or I can say, hey, you know, Sean, you look great today. <laughs> Only kidding, you look great today. First, first time, Sean looks great today. Second time, you don't want to see Sean on Nerf Shop days. I'm telling you right now, you look great today. You know? Listen to the difference. Could you please see me in the hallway? Thanks. See me in the hallway. Take a time out. Could you please chill out for a few minutes? Thanks, brother. It's like night and day. You also don't want to start any sense with the word you. If it's a request, you need to move your stuff over there. You need to knock that off. You need to look more interested in this talk, you. That's a W that's even worse. You want to start with I or we. Him alone comfortably. You seem bored already. So you can pretend to like the last 13 minutes. Gee, you know, I or we. By getting people to use this stuff, we can sometimes reduce restraints dramatically, restraint acting out. We also learned the affect scale, something I put a label on years ago, which is the scale of justice. As kids get louder, we should get quieter. Can I please see you in the hallway? No friggin' way, man. I need to see you now. Man. They get louder, you get quieter. These are techniques we developed to meet kids where they're at. We learned that you can't punish kids. You've got to use consequences. The difference between a consequence and a punishment is huge. A consequence is related to what a kid did. A punishment isn't. When you punish kids, you're basically inflicting pain as a way to ch change them. That doesn't work. Yet what do parents do all the time? They take a kid's favorite possession away. What do elementary school teachers do? They take recess away. You know, I say, if you were driving home from this training today and a cop pulled you over speeding and says, excuse me, miss, what's your favorite TV show? Uh, Law and Order. You can't watch it for a year. What? Give me the freaking ticket. That's two years for you. Had to, you go ballistic. You go, you, yeah, you go home, your kid's acting out. Give me the Game Boy. Consequences reinforce the values of a setting. If you're working at a detention center and a kid is really disrespectful to a staff member, and a supervisor ties into the kid, hey, you don't talk to Mrs. Jones that way. How many times did I tell you that's not the kind of language we use in a place like this? You know, you're grounded for the night. What are you doing? You're reinforcing the value of being respectful by being disrespectful? Goes on one out the, out the next. So this is stuff we learned early on, and it had such an amazing effect. Restraints went down. Kids start doing better. Uh, and then what I learned about 25 years later is that these techniques we had developed, they actually had a name. They were called using a strength-based approach. They were all under the umbrella of using a strength-based approach. What is strength-based practice? What is a strength-based approach? Here's a simple definition of strength-based practice. Strength-based practice is an emerging approach to guiding at-risk children and youth as exceptionally positive and inspiring. It's focused on strength building rather than flaw fixing what kids do right versus what they do wrong. It begins with a belief that all young people have or can develop strengths and use past successes to curb problem behavior and enhance academic social functioning. That's a simple definition that I've cobbled together. But to me, strength-based practice is really about two words, attitude and actions. It starts with the attitude you convey to every kid from the second you meet that kid in forever that says, I believe in you. I think you're one amazing kid. You're going to make it with me. You're going to make it in life. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of your journey. Now let's get going. 
than everything you do with these kids from the second you meet them and forever. And I say forever, because 20 years from now, they should be calling you up, checking you out, thanking you for being that one person who got in their head. You know? And why is it so important to have this incredible attitude? Plethora of reasons. One, it builds great relationships. And as we know, all of us here, one caring adult, one caring relationship could change a kid's life. I heard James Gabarino speak a few years ago. He's one of the world's foremost experts on kids and violence, written over 30 books. He got in front of a group of 1,000 people and said, we can now predict with almost 100% certainty whether a tough teenager with a history of aggression will commit another act of aggression when he enters the high school in the fall. We can look into this kid's life at any moment while they're at the school and see this one factor present, we don't worry about that kid. And that factor is one adult who thinks I'm terrific. One adult who thinks I'm terrific. I think I've worked with around 250 kids over the last 25 years as a behavior consultant, probably worked with thousands of kids in my 40 years. I bet a million dollars I placed my life on the line that every one of those kids woke up every day thinking, Mr. Appelstein can't wait to see me. I gotta be his favorite kid. Now, is that true? No, but they, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Like I said yesterday, you gotta be a great actor in this business. And if I have a kid who is tough to work with, I always think, what must have happened to this kid's life? What's going on in his brain to push a good guy like me away? You know, I always see myself as a pie. You should see yourself as a pie. And every kid you work with needs an equal slice. As, I, as I've said many times, the kid who's pushing away the most is always the one who needs you the most. Now, isn't it true that every tough kid you get referred struggles with self-doubt? How could that possibly not be true? Well, Degas, the great artist, said self-doubt kills ability. Strength-based practice says every single kid out there has amazing ability, no exceptions. But they're not gonna make it if they're riddled with self-doubt. When you really believe in them and inspire them, you start to attack that self-doubt. You do it in many ways. One way is by trumpeting success. In the strength-based world, we say little changes can ripple into dramatic solutions. You look for that little change for that kid to break out. I was working with a kid, middle school kid years ago. He was skipping school four days a week. The very first day I met him, I said, if you skip three next week, I'll give you a big sandwich. He skipped three, gave him a big sandwich. Teachers want to kill me. I said, how can you give this kid a, a freaking sandwich? I got kids coming every day that get nothing because he didn't skip four, he skipped three. Within three months, he's coming every day. Graduated with honors. I could give you 100 kids like that. Little changes. Kid is stuck, he's off track. Find that one little thing and get excited about that. Now, the other way we, many other ways we attack self-doubt is by modeling and teaching that it's okay to make mistakes. Why do so many kids melt down and struggle because they have these negative mindsets? I'm stupid, I can't do this. What we need to teach these kids and model for them, it's okay to make mistakes. I say to kids, what's a mistake? You know, and they have to say, an opportunity to take. What's a mistake? Or something else. What's a mistake? A chance to learn something new. What's a mistake? Yeah, you should come into work every day and say, hey guys, I'm taking an online course. I made a big mistake last night. Was I excited or what? What's a mistake? An opportunity to take. What's a mistake? Yeah, I did a training about three or four months ago at a juvenile detention center. Got an email two days later from a big burly guy. I remember him. He said, Charlie, is that your training? I was a little bad during your training, because I have a three-year-old. I don't think I've been doing what you're doing, saying. I think I've been too tough on him. Well, I really took to heart what you're saying, so my very first night at home, we're at dinner, my wife, the three-year-old, and all of a sudden, he pours his milk all over, spills his milk all over the kitchen table. Well, normally I get mad at him, but I took a step back, I took a deep breath, and I looked at him, and they were all looking at me. You know, because normally they expect me to get mad. So they were both looking at me. He spilled the milk, they're looking at me. I took a deep breath, I smiled, and I said, so you spilt the milk. So you spilt the milk. And then they started laughing, I started laughing. It was one of the most special moments of my career as a parent. You know, so you spilt the milk. And he said, thank you so much. If I ever write another book, I think I'm going to title it, So You Spilt the Milk. <laughs> so You Spilt the Milk, you know. Uh, this is how we help these kids to move forward. Uh, now, there's a guy named Sprick who writes really good books on behavior management when it comes to educators. 
He says, according to his research, there are two major reasons why kids often struggle in school. One, they don't believe they could do the work, and two, they have no clue why it's important to learn. I would be rich beyond belief if every time I got referred an acting out kid in a school, we found out that he had a hidden learning disability. He had Asperger's, he had sensory integration, he was being beaten at home, he wasn't eating breakfast in the morning. The biggest crock in the world is, and will always be, is that kids like acting out. What a crock, no kid likes acting out. If you could put truth serum into any kid and say, who would you rather be? You the kid who's skipping school, you the one who's bullying, you the one who's cutting yourself, you the one who's being belligerent, or that kid over there who has lots of friends, a wonderful family life, and a great future ahead of her. Who would you rather be? No kid would pick themselves. No kid would come close to them. Behavior is always a message. And us caring adults need to respond to that message. I remember working in elementary school, and there was a kid I wasn't really working with, but I knew the whole staff hated this kid. He was so provocative, belligerent. Year after year, they, no one wanted to work with this kid. After four years at the school, an audiologist found out that he could only hear every other word. Could you imagine how guilty that staff was? Can you imagine how that kid? No kid likes acting out. Anytime a group of kids, one kid's acting out, our first thought always has to be, what are we doing? What are we doing that, that's stopping this kid? You know? Every kid wants to do it, so can they do the work? Are they at the right level? Is there some neurological thing going on? Is they want to do it? You know? uh, I think the biggest mistake I made when I was a program director of a big residential center is I didn't push reading and writing enough. Because the kids would come back from school, and if you try to get them to do homework that night or that afternoon, they'd melt down. So we did more activities and skill building and that stuff. Uh, the studies now are clear. If you can raise a kid's reading level, you can change their life. If I was back in residential, I'd be bringing in learning specialists. I would be incentivizing kids. I'd have like a road to learning chart. You read for five minutes, you get a brick in a road. You get 10 bricks, you get, and I've used that lately with kids. The big mistake I made was thinking these kids didn't want to read or they weren't good at it. No, they were cautious. They felt bad that they were behind. I, I should address that. I would do that so much better now. And then why is it important to learn? You might be a teacher doing a lesson on Spain. You got three kids thinking about Maine, Main Street. That's where my mother got evicted last week. I plead with teachers all the time, make the work interesting, make it relevant, make your environment stimulating. Studies are coming out all the time now that say if you exercise the kids more, get them moving during the day, behavior improves dramatically. If you make it stimulated, make it interesting, make it relevant to their lives. If you're a teacher and these kids aren't doing well, your first thought should always be, what are we doing that's causing these kids? Not, you know, throw more rewards and consequences at them. Now, as important as everything is that I have mentioned, as reasons for believing in kids and inspiring kids and why this is so important, I have to believe the number one reason for having this incredibly powerful I believe in you attitude is, is that when you have that attitude and you give it to a kid, it leads to that four letter H word, you can't live life without, and what's that word? Hope. Hope is humanity's fuel. You could have a Mercedes Benz out in the parking lot, it's going nowhere if it doesn't have fuel. Strength-based practice says every single kid you work with is a Mercedes-Benz. But by the time they get to you, they're on empty, they're on fumes, some of these kids. These are not broken down dysfunctional kids that need to be fixed. If you think that, if they think that, that's how far you're getting. Maslow, the great theorist, said if you think you're a hammer, then everybody's a nail. If you think that's a no good acting out kid, that's probably how the kid's gonna think and that's how far they get. No, these are all gifted kids who come to you on empty. Your job is to put the fuel in so they can take that great engine and go somewhere. Tell me if this isn't true. When most of us go to bed at night, as we're tossed and turning, we start this Rolodex in our head. And we go card by card as we slowly doze off. So a lot of us will be tossed and turned at night. First card, friends. Oh, I'm seeing Bruce and Esther on Friday night. Maybe try that new Mexican place that opened up downtown. Wonder if he's still working at the company. Hey, that'll be fun. Boom, next card, money. Things a little tight right now, but my job's safe. Uh, might be able to get uh, some new golf clubs, uh, you know, in January. Hey, not so bad, not so bad. Boom, next card, family. Ah, uh, my daughter's 18. She could be a teenager, what? One more year? I could do anything for a year. And then you doze off and you wake up refresh the next day. Tell me if this isn't true. If some of the tough kids you're working with, if they could even get to bed at night. We would spend hours in our residential centers teaching staff how to get traumatized kids to bed at night. Because it's the first time all day that all the stimulation ceases. They're left to their thoughts, their demons. 
Some of these kids have had horrific things happen in their life. And when they're all alone in bed, that's what they're thinking about. Some of your kids will play video games all night, do drugs all night, wander the streets all night, because they don't want to be alone with their thoughts. We would break bedtime into littlest detail at our residential centers. Do they have a nightlight? How bright is the nightlight? Where is the nightlight placed? What kind of music do they listen to? How loud is it? Uh, how long do they listen? What kind of activities and physical activities do you do after dinner so maybe they're tired? We would break bedtime in a little detail because we know how difficult it was. So if some of your kids can even get to bed at a reasonable hour, they're tossing and turning, they start their Rolodex. First card, friends. Shit, I don't have any friends. You didn't hear that. Uh, shit, I don't have any friends. <laughs> Saddest thing in the world to me is the answer to the following question. How many of you have worked with at-risk kids can remember one tough kid you've ever worked with who had a best friend, a meaningful reciprocal relationship with another kid. Hardly any hands go up. In my new book, I call this a worldwide epidemic of friendless kids. Take a second and think about what your life would be like today without a friend in it. Don't you think little annoyances become big annoyances? Now you walk in the walk of these kids who act out. Why do we have this epidemic? Uh, I think the major reason is the fact that a lot of these kids are really self-centered, and they need to be. Self-centeredness is not self-love for the kids we work with, it's self-protection. Your kids are all self-centered because they have to be. The message they're sending by being self-centered is, I've learned I better take care of myself, I don't trust anyone else. And so when you're really self-centered based on your history, no one wants to make a friend with you. You don't want to make friends. So these sad kids that we work with, they don't make friends when they should in like kindergarten, and every year gets worse and worse. And then by the time they get to middle and high school, they're cutting themselves, they're getting pregnant, they're joining gangs, they're bullying, they're doing anything to deal with the utter loneliness they struggle with every day. And if it doesn't get any better, they sometimes pick up guns and shoot people. We could do so much more with kids in our society if we'd help them make friends, if we'd deal with behavior over here instead of here. Sure, we should get rid of the guns. I don't know why someone needs a machine gun or something like that. But my thing is, what about over here? What if every school in the country made it a big effort to make sure kids were learning to make friends in elementary school and middle school? We wouldn't have this over here. We wouldn't have this. When I first started training people, I would talk about limit setting and rewards, consequences. I hardly talk about it anymore because I'm over here. My stuff is all, how do we prevent this behavior? Because these kids are all great. And if we meet with them, they don't, we won't have the behavior problems. You know? uh, so I'll tell you what strength-based practice is all about. Strength-based practice is all about you and me getting to a kid's head. So a tough kid goes to bed at night, and all of a sudden one of your name pops up. Oh, I'm working with Mr. Johnson. I love Mr. Johnson. Oh, I beat him three in a row in speed chess today. Oh, did he get pissed off or what? You know, he said he was speed chess champion, you know, at Scottsdale University. And he writes books. Oh, I love that guy. I love that guy. It makes me feel like a million bucks. Oh, and then while we're playing, he says something nice about my father. OMG, no one's ever said anything nice about my father. He says, I never met your father, but I know all fathers love their kids. And I bet deep in your dad's heart, he wished he could have been there for you. God, that's the nicest thing I've ever heard. Most people say, keep it up, you'll end up like your father. I love Mr. Johnson. Makes me feel like a million bucks. Oh, and then we got up to leave. He grabbed my arm. He said, oh, by the way, 15 years from now, when you're really successful, and you've got cars, houses, the whole nine yards, because you're one of the most talented kids they ever work with, which uh, counselor from the school, Johnson, say it, Johnson, say it, Johnson, do you need to come back and maybe slip a few, too, who always believed in you? God, do I love that guy. I don't even know if I'm going to graduate. He thinks I'm going to be successful. Let me finish by telling you about Ricky and Mary Walsh. Ricky was one of the most difficult students at this special ed school that I was working at. Mary Walsh was his teacher for two years. She got in his head. Every day for two years, he pushed her buttons. He was relentless, but every day she greeted him with a smile. She talked to him about his future. She responded instead of reacted to him, yet he was relentless in pushing her buttons. He came with a lot of baggage. Mary told me that after he graduated, he started calling her on a regular basis, which kind of freaked me out, given how much torment he had thrown at her. But she says, yeah, he calls me on a regular basis. And then after about two years, I was talking to her one day, he says, hey, I, you, you won't believe this. I go, what? She says, Ricky called me today. And he was really excited, really excited. And, and I go, Rick, what, what's up, Rick? R what's up? He says, Mary, Mary, my landscaping company signed a contract today for $20,000, a $20,000 contract. Can you believe it, Mary? Can you believe it? And she says, oh, Ricky, that is wonderful. 
That is so great. I always knew you'd be successful. I just always knew you'd be successful. She said there was a long pause in the line. Then he said, yeah, that's why I've been calling. That's what this business is all about. You know, you get in their heads and you tell them you could do it. You get the treasure out in every one of these kids. Thank you. Thank you.